Well, happy Good Friday, everyone. I'm Zach, the online pastor here, and this is Casey. And we're about to join you in watching our Good Friday online experience. That's right. Now, on Sundays, we've been in a series called Seven Questions Jesus Asked. He really asked over 300 in the Bible, but these seven have helped us address things like fear, people pleasing, and how to prioritize your soul over things that the world offers to you. So if you haven't seen any of those messages, we highly encourage you to click on that playlist in our channel after today's message. In this Good Friday teaching, though, Pastor Chuck is going to tackle the question Jesus asked. Do you know what I've done for you? And within his message, he's going to lead us through taking communion together. So now is a great time to get these two items from your kitchen if you have them. Jesus would have used unleavened bread, which kind of looks like this, or if you have matzo crackers, that works too. You could also use bread. So just grab something to participate in communion today. You'll also want to grab some juice or wine as well. And Pastor Chuck, during our service today, will show us how to take these items throughout. Yes, and if you're local, we want to invite you to join us tonight at 7 p.m. for our in-person experience, which is going to be completely different from what we're about to watch here. We do want to stress that our in-person service is going to be rated PG-13 as we focus on the crucifixion. So we strongly suggest that you take your kids to kids' ministry tonight. It's available for babies through fifth graders, and they'll also have their own age-appropriate Good Friday experience over in kids' ministry. And of course, we want to remind you that we have services on Sunday for Easter at 7 a.m. in the backyard with Pastor Doug and at 8 a.m., 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. in the worship center. And of course, you can always watch any of our services online at any of these times. Yes, and we would love to know who's watching with us today. So please drop us a comment in the chat so we can say hi to you. But we hope this message helps you reflect on Jesus's great love for you. On this Good Friday, we thought it would be really, really good for all of us to center in on a question that Jesus asked at the Last Supper. We're actually in a series on questions Jesus asked, and we're looking at seven questions that Jesus asked. It's also interesting to note, which we keep telling you, Jesus loved to ask questions. Questions that would keep, take us deeper. Questions that would make us think about the purpose and meaning in life. Questions that would ask us about where we are and where we should be. And Jesus, over the course of those three years of ministry, asked 370 que 307 questions, actually. But we're looking at seven of them. And tonight, tonight, we're going to look at one that he on purpose set up everything to aim at. He orchestrated event after event so these questions would be asked. And hopefully all of us would answer it in the right way. What's the question? The question is this. Do you know what I've done for you? Do you know what I've done for you? So let's go ahead and stop right now and ask that for each of us. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Because I think a lot of times we don't really go to the depths of what that answer should mean. See, Jesus did so much for us. And uh, Jesus loves you so much. He came from heaven to earth so that you could have a relationship with God the Father. Jesus loves you so much. He came from heaven to earth to humble himself and die on a cross for our sins so you and I would be free and you and I would be cleansed and you and I would be forgiven. Jesus loves us so much that he would be able to come and by your committing your life to him, you would become a brand new creation and the old things would pass away and all things would become new. Jesus loves you so much that he wanted you to be adopted by God so that you would truly have God as your father, but not just father, your Abba father. And Abba is an Aramaic word for daddy. He wants you to have that intimate relationship with God. Jesus loves you that much. And by the way, even more. There's so many other things he did. But the question is, do you know what Jesus has done for you? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? And Jesus, Jesus did all this and more. And Jesus wants us to be aware aware of what it can mean if you commit your life to him, live your life for him, and live the life he's called you to. That's what Jesus wants you to experience. So along with delving into the question Jesus asked, I want to ask another one. Because as I was studying for this, I began to wonder about it. I began to think about it. So it's a, a question Jesus asked that rose this question to my mind. And I want you to think about what this question would mean. Do you know 
what the meat of the word is. M-E-A-T, by the way, not M-E-T, the meat. M-E-A-T. Do you know what the meat of the word is? From time to time, I have people come up and say to me, Pastor Chuck, I really want to get into the meat of the word. And when I'm listening to them, not trying to be judgmental, I begin to understand they probably don't really know what they're asking for. They probably really don't know what the meat of the word is. Because if they did, I don't think they'd be asking the question in the same way or thinking they were going to get a particular answer that they would think I'm going to give to them. So here's the thing I want you to think about. The Bible does teach there's solid food of the word and there's also the the meat or milk of the word. So there's the milk of the word and the meat of the word. And we need to understand that. And so God wants us to know that. Peter, by the way, gives us an admonition in second first Peter chapter two, verses one to three, where it's therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So if you and I have tasted the kindness of the Lord, we want to put aside all the bad and crave the milk of the word of God. Now, by the way, the milk of the word of God is awesome. The milk of the word of God is amazing. And so it's incredible that you and I are always able to partake of what's called the the milk of the word of God. But There is the solid food, the solid food for the mature. And we have begun to call that the meat of the word. And by the way, we need to understand what the meat of the word is. Uh, By the way, let me say this. It might surprise you that the meat of the word is not knowledge. Uh, Knowledge is good. Knowledge is not bad. But there's a danger that comes with thinking the meat is knowledge. Because Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge puffs up but love builds up. Now don't miss that. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So Paul says that if we have knowledge that doesn't feed into love, actually going out and showing love, living love, uh, experiencing love, but giving love to other people, by the way, even our enemies, even those who don't agree with us, then we're not going to get to the true meat of the word. And so we need to understand that. You see, over the years, it breaks my heart How many people have gotten knowledge of the Word of God, knowledge of the Bible, but it's all only turned them evil, mean, bitter, and cruel, divisive even. And you know what? That is not what the meat of the Word is. So when knowledge leads to that, it leads to destruction. And so what you and I need to know is that God has a better way. God has a better plan for you, for me. And we need to understand that the meat of the word is not knowledge. It's not knowledge. And I've seen how many times Christians have thought that's what it would lead to by getting more and more knowledge, but they didn't get more and more loving. And so what we need to hold on to is that. By the way, the meat of the word, again, is not knowledge. So a lot of times when people are asking for the meat, they want me to teach them the Hebrew or they want me to teach them the Greek. By the way, I love getting into the original language. I love getting into the meanings of the Hebrew words or the Greek words. They all are awesome and cool. But that isn't meat of the word. So again, the question comes down to you know what the meat of the word is. By the way, the meat of the word is not going verse by verse through scripture, even though I love going verse by verse through scripture. That's not the meat of the word. So what is the meat of the word? And hopefully you're going to understand what that has to do with the question Jesus is asking. So the meat of the word, ready here, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. The meat of the word is doing what is right. It's doing what's right. Now, catch that. It's doing. You have to do it. And you have to do what is right or righteous. The meat is righteousness. And it's applying the word of God into our life in a way that we go out and live it. And that we're doers of the word and not hearers of the word only. That's where the meat of the word comes in. In Hebrews chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews is calling the people from immaturity to maturity. He's calling them to begin to live a life that is more mature, more depth, more applicable to who they are and the challenges they're facing, by the way. So then he gets to a section in Hebrews 5, verse 12, where it says, For though by this time 
You ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. He says, you know what? I can't give you solid food. Why? Because you guys are, are not mature enough to take it. You know, if you try to give a, a solid food to a baby who's not mature enough to take it, they, they're not going to not only be able to eat it, it could harm them. They could choke on it. And he goes, but you guys should have been there by now. You're still on the milk and you should have been to the place of the meat. And then it says this in verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to, here's the phrase, the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. The word of righteousness is actually meaning the word of going out and doing righteousness and doing the right thing. It's about not just hearing God's word, but going out and living it, obeying it, uh, applying it to your life. And, and making it the joy of your heart to be able again to take God's instruction and put it into action. It says in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice, notice that it's practice. There's a practice going out and doing because of practice have their senses discerned, uh, trained to discern good and evil. Uh, by the way, that's in the New American Standard Version, which I love. But in the NLT, it translates it this way. And I think it might bring it home. It says, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Did you catch that? The infant does not know how to do, how to do what is right, which is the actual meat of the word. And in verse 14 in the New Living, it says, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have their skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So someone who's mature knows the difference between right and wrong. And they know how to do what is right and practice righteousness. So we're going to get into the meat of the word. And we're going to dig into it right now by going to the question Jesus asked. And then I'm going to link that to the idea of how you and I actually go from milk to meat. Where are we at right now in the timeline? We're at the time of the Last Supper. The Last Supper is now going to take place, and it's on a Thursday night before what we call Good Friday. It's a few hours till Good Friday will be coming. In a few hours, Jesus would be betrayed. And in just a few hours, Jesus would be tortured, and he would die a cruel death on the cross. It's just hours away. It's just hours away. But what you need to know is this. It's at the Last Supper that Jesus had some things that he had to do and things he had to put in place. This is something Jesus had a passion for. And before he would be betrayed, before he would go to the cross, he had to do this and he had to put some things in place with these men he loved so that they would be able to actually go out and live what he's been teaching them for three years. Uh, Jesus told these men that he loved them and he longed to have this meal with them. In Luke 22, verse 15, it says this, Jesus said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He goes, ah, I've longed for this moment. I've earnestly desired to be with you in eating the Passover meal together, but it's not just in Passover that he's going to celebrate with them and actually teach them and show them. It's when, so he does some things that could be shocking. Things actually, I'm going to say, that were shocking to them in their day and time. So let's pick up in John chapter 13 as this night begins. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing. Now notice that. He knew something. Knowing something is his motivation. Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had girded. Now, the thing is, Jesus did all this knowing something. 
That's what we need to key in on first. Uh, the idea of knowing. Jesus knew his hour had come. He knew he would be departing from this world. Uh, Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. Knowing who you are is, is the key to embracing true humility. Uh, especially, most importantly, knowing who you are in the Lord. Knowing your identity in Christ. Knowing your calling in Christ. Then know what happens then is we're able to embrace humility. And that's what Jesus did. He embraced humility by taking off his garments, girding himself with the towel, and actually functioning as a slave and washing the people's feet. See, remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I love that. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And Jesus in that moment isn't focused on who he is or even what he's going to do when he dies on the cross. He's focused on and has a passion for these men discovering deep, deep truths that would be transformational in their life. So Jesus takes up a towel to demonstrate humility. We're to do the same thing. We're to have the same mindset. By the way, Paul in Philippians would call for us to think like Jesus and act like Jesus, especially like Jesus did in this moment. So in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But what did he do? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Even death on the cross. See, he humbled himself. He didn't look out for his own personal interest. He actually went and wanted to serve others and care for others and, and show love to others. And so he did that by washing feet. He did it by washing feet in that moment. When you and I are selfish then very often we're divisive. And then at best, we're a baby Christian. Say, catch that again. When we're selfish and become divisive, we at the very best are baby Christians. They're not Christians at all. And Paul brings that out in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, where he says this, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as the spiritual men, but as the men of the flesh, as the infants in Christ. And he goes on to say, I gave you milk to drink and not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? See, when we are like Jesus, we humble ourselves and we think of others. When we're like Jesus, we don't come to be served but to serve. And that's what Jesus was showing them in such a tangible way in this very moment. By the way, in the time that Jesus lived, uh, it was not considered uh, a good thing to touch someone's feet. I, I think sometimes we act like the foot washing was something that would just be beautiful and wonderful, but not in their day, not in their time. By the way, probably not in our day or in our time either, but definitely not back then. It was something grotesque. It was something you would, you would literally have to bite your t- uh, teeth together to get through if you were going to do something like that. Why? People wore sandals and walked dirty streets. Animals would go to the bathroom on those streets, so they would walk in the midst of that. So when you entered someone's house with that dirty feet, you weren't just tracking dirt in. You weren't just tracking dust in. You'd be tracking the excrement from animals all over the house. And nobody would want that. So what you would do in some way, you would have to wash your feet before you entered the house. And in that moment, they needed to do that. It made foot washing a necessity, but not something somebody wanted to do. Not something anybody would cherish doing. And not someone that someone would want to do for somebody else. And Jesus, by the way, had sent Peter and John to set up the room for the Last Supper, to arrange for the Passover meal. But they forgot to designate anybody to do the foot washing. It was something they overlooked, maybe because they didn't want to think about it. Maybe they wanted to ignore it. Have you ever ignored something you just didn't want to do or keep putting it off? That's most likely what these two men did. And so what happened is no one was set to do it. 
And when Jesus realized that, what did he do? He got up from the meal and he began to do what no one else wanted to do, what no one else wanted to lower themselves to do. And he began to go and wash people's feet in that moment. And he was washing the feet the way only a servant or a slave would do it. By the way, I think they freaked out just like we would freak out today. One time I was in a, a, a church listening to my friend Dave Stone preach. There was probably almost 9,000 people there. It was packed. And Dave got up and began to talk about the idea of foot washing. And he goes, before I preach on it and teach on it, tonight I think we should start by washing each other's feet. And you could see people looking around. He goes, the ushers are going to be coming down in a moment with the basins and towels. So all of you take off your shoes and you'll wash the feet of the people next to you. And then you see people really freaking out. And he starts laughing and go, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but I think it shows the reaction probably the apostles had. When Jesus is doing it, they can't believe it. They're probably freaking out in this moment too. And so Jesus wants to do this for them in a very, very special way. And he wants to make this a moment that they'll never, ever forget. And so in that moment, he begins to go from one apostle to the next, girded with the towel, washing the feet and putting their feet on the towel that's wrapped around his waist, getting dirtier and dirtier as he goes. And then he comes to Peter. And you already know, many of you, what happened. Peter's like, no. Lord, you're never going to do this to me. Lord, you're not going to let this happen. Listen to what it says in John 13, verse 6. It says, so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said, no, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him and said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> In other words, give me a bath. If I need to have that to be a part of you, I will. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew that one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now, by the way, I love Peter's enthusiasm, and I think many of you do too. I love the passion that he has, that he says, Lord, whatever it takes to be as close to you and do as much as I can, I will. But he also had another part of him that I wonder about. Lord, never. Lord, no. Think about that. How can you say Lord and then say never? Or Lord and then say no? Remember, we started this series with the question Jesus asked in Luke 6, 46. Why would you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. And so we need to understand Peter in that moment's got a problem. On the one hand, he wants to be completely committed, immersed in what it means to have a relationship with Christ. But the only way that can happen is you can't say these words, no, Lord, no, Lord. No, you never say that to Jesus. Or you can't say never. You can't say that to Jesus. You've got to say yes, Lord. And you've got to want what he wants and dive into what he has for you. Then Jesus, in that moment, asked the question to Peter, to all the rest of the apostles that are sitting there. It says in verse 12, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? Do you know what I've done for you? Do you know what I've done for you? And I've got a feeling they looked at each other and thought, I don't. I'm not sure why. Why would you do such a thing? In that moment, they didn't get it. Did they know what Jesus did for them? He served them because the Son of Man came to serve and not be served. He showed humble servant to the, each and every one of them. To James, the older brother of John, who would be the first to die for him, he washed his feet. To John, the younger brother of James, who would live out his whole life serving Jesus, Jesus washed his feet. To Thomas, who struggled with doubt and, and wavered in times of commitment, Jesus washed his feet. To Peter, who in a short period of time would deny Jesus three times, he washed Peter's feet. And to Judas, who would betray him with a kiss. One of the worst betrayals of all. And Jesus would look at him on that night and say, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And he washed his feet. 
So here's what we need to grab hold of. And we saw earlier that Jesus said that he knew that Satan had entered the heart of Judas. So Satan has already come inside Judas and Jesus washes his feet. And he says, do you know what I've done for you? Do you know what I've done for you? Jesus showed love and care to each and every one of them. Now catch this, whether they deserved it or not. Jesus showed love and care to every one of them, whether they deserved it or not. So that brings the question to us. Do you know what he did? Do you know what he did for them? And do you know what he's done for us? Because that's key to how we live our lives today. Do we really understand? Do we really get it? There's been a controversy that came recently, by the way, over foot washing. Many of you know what I'm talking about, but if you don't, uh, a group of people who run a group called He Gets Us, the He Gets Us campaign, where they say that Jesus gets us, Jesus gets us, and they've been putting commercials on TV. During the Super Bowl, many of you know they put a commercial on where, where, Jesus, where, where people were washing other people's feet. Always in each case, every scene that was shown were people who were polar opposites, people who would not agree, people who would not normally choose to live life together, people who would not normally uh, want to show love to each other. But one was washing the other person's feet. And at the very end, it says that Jesus didn't come to hate, he came to wash feet. Now, you know what's so interesting? That became controversial, but pretty much only a controversy amongst Christians, or at least people who say they're Christians. So divisiveness started happening. And I was so intrigued by that because I thought, why are you so upset? Why are you so mad? I know many of the people that were portrayed in the, the ad were people that were not Christians or not living a Christian lifestyle. But you know what? The question I want to ask you is, do you know what he did for us? Do you know what he did for you? What would he have done for them? Would Jesus have washed their feet? And when I began to watch that, I began to think, why are people so mad? Because I want to tell you my take on this. There wasn't one person in that ad that was portrayed having their feet washed that is a worse sinner than I am. Are they worse than you? Are you somehow better than them? Are you more deserving of Jesus washing your feet? Are you? Because if you know what he did for you, I don't think you could say that. I don't think you could feel that. I can't. Because I can tell you, I don't look at any of them and say, oh, they're worse than me. They don't deserve God's love. They don't deserve God's care. They don't deserve the death of Jesus on the cross for them, where the greatest service was shown. And you know what the scary thing is? I think a lot of people who got upset about that commercial uh, and I know this might bother some of you. I think it may be you're not ready for the meat of the word of God. You're not ready for the real meat of the word of God where you live out love and compassion, where you care about everybody, where no one is a, uh, so bad that you can't show love to them, even if they were your enemy. If you know, if you know what he's done for you, if you know what he's done for you. And so I want you to think about that. By the way, Doug Houston said something that I thought was pretty interesting. Doug says, do, do many of us know that the group that sponsors He Gets Us has a website and now thousands and thousands of people have gone there and have actually put down their information to be contacted and mature Christians all across the country, but even from our Corona area, have contacted them and got a hold of them and led a lot of them to Christ. Does that make it better? I think it may, but I think in the end, what I want us to have us think about is this. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Jesus came to show us who we are and how we're to live. We're to have the same attitude Jesus has. We are to see Jesus as an example that we want to follow. And by the way, that's the essence of discipleship. Discipleship is where I want to become like Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. And then I love this next part. Verse 25, it is enough. It is enough for the disciple that he becomes like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of the household? So what is Jesus saying? That two things are true of a disciple. Number one, we're not above our master. He's above us. So Jesus is not the one who we see ourselves as above or we don't see us telling him what to do. We are the ones who serve him. So he's our Lord. 
The second thing is this, is we want to be like him. It is enough that we be like our master. It's enough that we be like our teacher. But if we're going to be like Jesus, guess what? We have to wash feet. We have to wash the feet of the one who will stay loyal till he dies. And we have to wash the feet of the one who would betray you or deny you. We have to wash feet. And nobody's above our caring for them and loving them and serving them if we know, if we know what it's like to be like Jesus. By the way, it's your destiny to be like Jesus. Did you know that? You were destined by God to be like Jesus. So you have to choose. Do you want to live out your destiny? In Romans chapter 8, 29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Did you catch that? You were predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And then he also glorified. So you know what? We were predestined to be like Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to do. And that's who we want to be. And uh, that's got to be one of the greatest desires of your life. By the way, uh, one night, uh, not that long ago, I was walking out of the church on a Wednesday night service. And I went out the back of the church and went down the stairs. And a family came walking by. And I said, hey, how are you guys doing? And they said, great. And the mom looked at her little girl and she said, do you know who this is? And the girl looked right at me and she goes, Jesus. <laughs> I, I loved it. Her mom's like, no, no, it's not. But I was like, oh, well, so here's the thing. You know what? One day I want that to be more true than ever for me and for you. That people look at us and say that, you know what? If I were to picture Jesus, I would picture you. But the only way that'll ever happen is when we put on the towel. And by the way, if you want the meat of the word of God, it starts by putting on the towel. It starts by putting on the towel. And we need to understand that. See, Jesus, Jesus wants us to know what it's like that we serve people and care for people. So Jesus goes on to explain what he did. After he asked the question, do you know what I've done for you? He said this in verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then, I then, the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one sent greater than the one who sent him. Verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed. You are blessed if you do them. You know these things, you're blessed if you do them. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He clearly states, hey, I am teacher and I am Lord. But then he humbled himself and washed the feet of everybody to give them an example to follow. And then he said the blessing comes not in the knowing, but the doing. That's why I think I'm going to be tempted from this point on. When someone walks up to me and says, Pastor Chuck, I want the meat of the word of God. Then my next response is going to be, where can I sign you up to serve? Because if they want the meat, you got to go serve. You know what? Are you ready to go serve? If they go, no, I want a Bible study. I love Bible study, but that's not what I'm talking about. The meat is going to a Bible study so that you can be a doer of the Word of God and not a sponge that soaks it in that never lets it out. And so you and I need to understand what Jesus says here. The blessing comes not in the knowing. The blessing comes in the doing. And so you and I need to know that. And so we need to be aware of that. The meat of the word, it's in the doing and obeying that Jesus says that we actually start to understand and live out righteousness. And we want to be a part of doing that. It's, in the it's not in the title, it's in the towel. It's not in the title, it's in the towel. And the question is, how's your towel? And by the way, if it's too clean, it's time to go out and get it dirty by serving, by washing feet, by being a part of that. So I want you to think about that. Where can we sign you up to serve? Where are you serving? That's where we find the meat of the word. And those who can answer the question, do you know what I've done for you? Are people who are going to say, Lord, I get it. You set an example and I'm going to follow that example and I'm going to go out and I'm going to live this out the way I should. So that's what we need to understand. That's what we need to grab hold of. The blessing is found in the doing. Verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. So tonight, on this very, very special night, 
let me ask you a question. Are you somebody who knows these things? And do you know what he's done for you? Do you know that he loves you? Do you know that he cares about you? Do you know that he died on the cross for you? Do you know that no matter how, how deprived and depraved the depths of your sin are, he would wash your feet. And he died on the cross because you, you matter to him. And his love is truly unconditional. And there's no sin you could commit more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. But the question is right now, some of you may need to ask, do you know what he did for you? And do you know that he, he did it because he wanted you to have that love. He wanted you to have that transformation. And so right now, before we go on with a couple of other things, I want to ask you, no matter where you are right now, no matter what place you're in, no matter what you've done, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord that's real and vital and true, this is a chance. This is your opportunity to say yes. How do you do that? By praying a prayer and saying, yes, Lord. Not no, Lord. Not never, Lord. Yes, Lord. And so, you know what? Some of you tonight, I'm praying, are going to pray this prayer. And for those of you who love the Lord right now, would you pray for people to say yes to Jesus? So let's pray. Lord, I pray right now in this moment that you would be with anybody who is uh, not close to you, they're not living a life in relation to you. They're not understanding the, the person you've made them to be and the life you've made them to live. And I pray that wherever they are, they can sense your presence. I pray that they would know you're the Lord of space and time. So it doesn't matter what we're doing right now. You're with them in this moment. And I pray they'd open their heart to you. And I pray they'd commit their life to you. So I pray for someone right now who doesn't feel that you could love them or forgive them. Lord, I pray something's happening where they're beginning to feel, no, it's not true. You love them. And you can and not only can, but you will forgive them if they would commit their life to you. I pray for someone tonight who, Lord, they're, they're stagnant. And they're not living a life that's vital and alive and true and fulfilling that they would pray this prayer to give their life to you. I pray for some people who have relationships that are so divided that they don't know that they could ever come back together. I pray tonight they, they would give their life to you and watch you bring healing and new direction to them. I pray that will happen. So right now in this moment, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to do this. Would you pray a prayer with me? If you want to say yes to the Lord for the first time or recommit your life, pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus... I know you love me and I know you died on the cross for me. I pray you'd forgive me of all my sins. I pray you'd forgive me, Lord, of all the things I've done that aren't right and the things that I never did that I should have. I pray, Lord, you'd heal me from hurt and pain. I pray you'd free me from anything or anyone that would hold me down or hold me back. But most of all, I pray you'd make me yours and pray you'd make me alive and pray you'd make me brand new. So I say yes to you. And if that's all you can pray, God knows your heart. Jesus knows your heart and he loves you. Just say, I say yes to you. And I say yes to the life you have for me. So take me now and make me yours. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you pray that prayer, praise God. And what we want you to do, we really want you to do this. Find a way to text amen to 77247. Find a way to text amen to 77247. So I want you to go back with me to the Last Supper, back in that moment after he's washed feet, back after he said, do you know what I've done for you? And they all sat there and he said, you know what? The blessing comes not in the hearing, but the doing. Blessed are you. Now, if, not if you just know these things, but if you do these things. And what did he do next? He, ha he began to sing a hymn and he began to lead them through a Passover meal. The Passover meal was amazing. It is amazing even to this day because it's very symbolic. Uh, they would have bitter herbs there and, and Jesus would have held that up and said, these herbs are to remind us of the bitterness our fathers experienced in the land of Egypt when they were slaves. And right now, eat of this and think of them, but also of all the people out there who are living bitter lives and are hurting. 
And you would do that in a way not only to experience some bitterness, but to care for those who are living in a life like that. He would have taken uh, uh, probably some kind of a green and dipped it in salt water. And he would have said, this is to remind us of the tears our forefathers shed in the land of Egypt uh, when they were having to build uh, pyramids and having to go get straw. He goes, let's remember their tears. Let's remember the tears of all those who are hurting that they've shed. And you would take it and you would eat it and you would remember and care for hurting people. And then somewhere in the middle of the meal, Jesus would have taken bread. And what he normally would have done is he would have held up this unleavened bread and he would have said, this is the bread of affliction to remind us of the afflictions our fathers suffered in Egypt and the pain they went through and to remind us of the affliction that people go through all the time, all around the world. That's what he would have done normally. He probably did that two years before each year. But tonight he didn't do it. On this night before Good Friday, he had picked up the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they, they began to eat the bread. Now I want you to think about what that means. Jesus died for your hurt. Jesus died for your pain. Jesus died for your affliction. He did die for your sins. We'll get to that but he also died for the sins and the hurt and the pain you've experienced. So he would say, let's take this together. And if you have a way to do this with me right now, I'd love for you to do that. Right now, take some bread and let's partake together and do this in remembrance of him. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you took our hurt, you took our pain, you wanna bear our burden, and you wanna bring healing. And where there's hurt and pain, you want to bring joy. You want to bring peace. And you will bring love. Let's partake. Then they would have gone on in the meal. They would have had lamb. They would have had some other foods. They would have drank wine more than once. And then the meal would end and there would be a cup sitting there. It was called the cup of Elijah. That cup, by the way, is always filled to the very, very brim. And the idea is that you would look at it and, and you would think when Elijah comes before the Messiah comes, when Elijah comes to prepare the way of the Lord, that he somehow is going to drink from every single cup all around the world. But Jesus, rather than ending the meal, he picked up the cup after the meal. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. For the forgiveness of your sins, do this in remembrance of me. And then he would have them all begin to take from the cup. And they had to sit there thinking, what's going on? What's going on? He had told them that very soon he would be betrayed and died. He told them that it was God's plan all along. But the plan was this, that the blood of Christ, which is so powerful, it can wash away any sin. That though your sins be like scarlet, Jesus will make them white as snow. That's the promise of a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. He said, do this in remembrance of me and let's do together. Let's do together. Let's partake. And Lord, we do. We remember the fact that your blood was shed because you love us and you know that with sin upon us, we cannot enter the presence of a holy God. But by the power of your blood, the sin is taken away. And though my sins be like scarlet or any of our sins are like scarlet, they become white as snow. And because of you and not because of us, we're forgiven and we're cleansed. And Lord, now we can enter God's presence and know his love. And with that promise that if we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us now becomes true based on your blood and based on what you did. And then Jesus would have sang a hymn with them, and they left. They left then to walk down to a place called Gethsemane where he would be betrayed by Judas, and he would then be put into the hands of those who would torture him, and he would go to the cross on Good Friday. He would die for our sins, be put into a tomb, and three days later rise again on Easter. What we celebrate is Easter which I think is so amazing. So tonight is a special, special night as we think about that.
There's also one other thing I want you to think about. It's all about love. Uh, the fact that Jesus loves you is why he died on the cross for you. And the why God the Father called for this moment. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, he gave. And he gave that which was most precious, his only begotten Son. So on Good Friday, I think there's a lot of us, and this may be you, we, we want to not only receive the love of God, we want to show love back to God. And Jesus said one way we do that is in chapter uh, Luke chapter 6, where he says, uh, Matthew chapter 6, where he says, where your treasure is, your heart is also. So it may be a night, for many of us it is, that we want to show love to the Lord by giving financially to Him. If that's true of you, this is our time for you to do that. And how do you do that? You can text GIVE to 77247, or you can go to our app and, and give there. But if you want to tonight, you say, you know what, I want to be a part of that. I'm going to give. I'm going to give. And then in this moment, you can say, Lord, I want to not just say I love you. I want to show my love to you. And so I thank God for all of us who want to come together and we want to give together so that we can see the kingdom of God moving forward in a way that we're partnering with the Lord in something he's called us to do. And for all of you who are doing that right now or are doing it any time, I just want you to know how thankful I am to share in this with you. But that is, uh, brings our night to an end. It brings it to a close. But for me, it's a very special Good Friday night that I've got to spend with you right now. And I hope and pray that you know that this is true. Jesus loves you. And if you right now were at your worst, he would take off his robe, put on a towel, he would wash your feet. Why? Because he wants you to be cleansed. He wants you to be a part of him. And he wants you to know his love. And I hope you and I would be able to say, Lord, I know what you've done for me. I know what you've done for me. And now I, Lord, I know, Lord, this, the blessing comes not in the knowing, but in the doing, which, by the way, is the meat of the word. May God bless you. May you have an amazingly great rest of your Good Friday. And may we see you Easter Sunday. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, we hope you'll text AMEN to 77247 so we can provide you with some resources to help you on this journey. And if you'd like to be baptized, we'd love to get that scheduled for you on our campus or wherever you're watching from. You can text BAPTISM to 77247. And if this message resonated with you or if you need prayer for something, would you let us know in the comments? Our team reads every comment that comes through and we really love interacting with you. Yes, and if this message added value to your life, click the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you never miss messages from us. And consider sharing the link with someone else who might need it today. We're live on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. right here online and Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. But this Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll have services in person and online at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. We hope to see you there as we celebrate the Risen King. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.